Hello and welcome to the first Napoleon 200 event of 2021. These are, of course, still very uncertain times for us all, uh, and that extends to our plans to commemorate the bicentenary of Napoleon's death in May of this year. Um, if you are on our mailing list, you will know that we will be making a decision on our plans for this year at the end of this month, when we know our guidance from the UK government. Um, however, even with COVID making so much unsure, uh, we can and we are continuing with this, our successful online events programme. Um, and before I introduce tonight's speaker, I have two dates to add to your diary. Um, on the 18th of March, Dan Yon, social anthropologist at York University in Toronto, uh, will share his contemplations on exile with historian Hlaunipa Makina from Vitz University in Johannesburg uh, and the author and travel writer Will Atkins. Uh, so please do join us for that. Um, and on the 15th of April, we're excited to welcome Andrew Roberts, successful historian and author of Napoleon the Great, uh, and Sir Brian Unwin author of Terrible Exile, The Last Days of Napoleon on St. Helena, uh, and our Chair of Trustees. Uh, so please do put both of those dates in your diary, the 18th of March and the 15th of April, at the same time, uh, six o'clock UK time. Uh, so that takes us to tonight's event, and we are absolutely delighted to welcome Peter Hicks uh, to pre present to us his work on the British witnesses to Napoleon on St. Helena. Um, Peter is International Affairs Manager of the Fondation Napoleon uh, and a trustee of our charity, the British Napoleonic Bicentenary Trust. Um, he is an honorary fellow of the Institute on Napoleon and the French Revolution, uh, Florida State Uni uh, uh, University, as well as a professor at the Institut Catholique d'Etudes Supérieures at roche sur -Yon. He has written extensively on Napoleon, including on Lascasse and the Memorial of St. Helena, uh, on the significance of the Battle of Waterloo and on the Napoleonic Empire and its impact on European political culture. And he's joint editor of volume three of the soon to be published Cambridge History of the Napoleonic Wars, uh, which is in press and will be in bookshops shortly this year. Uh, and the head editor of that collection is our other trustee, uh, Professor Alan Forrest. On top of all that, Peter is also a musician uh, who's organised and performed festivals of Napoleonic and Georgian music, including on St. Helena uh, and at the uh, Hotel des Invalides in Paris. So, Peter, on that note, I'll hand over to you uh, to present to us the British Witnesses to Napoleon on St. Helena. Thank you very much, James. Delighted to be here. Um, so, what I want to talk to you about this evening about is... The almost British obsession with Napoleon. Now, uh, obviously, Napoleon died 200 years ago in May 1821, but that was like the end of almost a crescendo of book publishing on Napoleon. Now, the first lives of Napoleon ever published in the world were written in English. That's a quite extraordinary fact. In 1797, Napoleon was barely 28. And already it's a bit like a footballer's biography. They were writing biographies of this, this wonder of the, of the world who had just won rather splendidly the first Italian campaign. And in 1797, somebody decided it was a good idea to publish his memoirs of his time with Napoleon at school. It's extraordinary, called Some Account of the Early Years of Buonaparte. This was subsequently translated into French. So what was written in English was then transmitted to a French public even before Napoleon had become first consul. Then, at the same time, there was a publication for li British liberals called Biographical Anecdotes, and similar details were reproduced after conversations with uh, emigres from the French Revolution in London, of which there were quite a few. Um, another biography was soon to be published in 1803 by a Newcastle liberal called William Burden, he was very, very keen on Napoleon, thought Napoleon was the bee's knees. Uh, and then unfortunately for William Burden, Napoleon then proclaimed himself uh, not just um, consul for 10 years, but then consul for life. And then finally said he was going to become emperor. And for a liberal like William Burden, that was all a bit too much. So he then published a sort of second 
biography a year later, 1804, republished in 1805, a bit more critical, saying Napoleon's not quite the liberal hero we were expecting. Um, so that was that. And then uh, in 1808, the most scientific, the most academic biography of Napoleon published before Napoleon's death was published by uh, a strange, mysterious Dutchman called Ludovic van Es, published in English, in uh, nine volumes over a period of 19 years, beginning in 1806. So here we have the British public, which is presented with quite an academic biography. This academic biography included, say, letters uh, that Napoleon had written to different uh, government bodies. Um, so it was like a history that was backed up by period documents. So really a proper history, not at all a scurrilous critique of someone who was an enemy of Britain, but rather like a serious biography of someone trying to understand quite how Napoleon first consul, Napoleon the emperor, had actually come to power, had become the man of salvation as seen through the French eyes, and then the extraordinarily successful emperor with the French army for at least the first five years, for five or six years of the empire. So this is much more than we could have been read by a French audience at the time. So you've got much more bi biographical material about Napoleon in English than you even have in French, which is quite surprising. And that's that's like that's kind of an odd fact and little known. Um, which brings us to, of course, 1815. 1815, this moment in the sort of the, the fallout after the Battle of Waterloo, Napoleon not sort of persona non grata, not only in the rest of Europe, but now also in France, is kind of like making his way into exile, wondering what he's going to do, and then finally makes it to the French coast, slightly pursued by the French police, but not really sort of giving him chance to get, a, get away. He then decides, well, America might work, but it's pretty tricky to get past the blockade. So he hands himself over to um, the British. Now, this is quite a dramatic kind of decision, but he thinks, well, it's the only chance, really, because if he gets caught by the Prussians, that could be complicated. Not quite sure what's going to happen to him in France now that there's a, um, a royal king, Louis XVIII, who's now back on the throne after the, after the first uh, restoration. So it's all a bit complicated. So Napoleon thinks, right, best thing to do is get out, um, see what will happen if I try to surrender to the British, So, which is what he does. Uh, he lands, uh, first of all, in a ship called Bellerophon, um, which uh, some of the characters who meet Napoleon on Bellerophon already start writing about him. There's a famous character called John Bowerbank, who's a lieutenant on Bellerophon, who publishes already before the end of the year. This comes out, Napoleon's just arrived in St. Helena, and already there's a book about Napoleon talking about his conversations with the emperor on board ship. So Bowerbank leaping onto the publication wave, this tradition of talking about Napoleon and writing that there and then. And then after that, Napoleon, having got from the Bellerophon onto Northumberland, uh, the ship that's going to take him all the way to St. Helena, leaving sometime in August, and the doctor on that ship, the surgeon, a man called William Warden, spends a lot of time chatting with Napoleon, and becomes kind of like a friend of Napoleon, or well, rather not as so much a friend, but a sort of an acquaintance, but he does have access to Napoleon and can go up to Longwood, uh, whereas other people maybe wouldn't have had access to him because he'd known Napoleon on, on Northumberland. And he publishes one of the first sort of accounts of Napoleon, not only on Northumberland, but also on St. Helena. So this publication about Napoleon, what it does it brings you interest, but it also brings you money. People are thinking that publication is going to be something that is going to be bring me a bit of cash. And Warden uh, thinks that's going to be the case. And as does Barry O'Mara, who is someone I will be talking about later on this evening. In fact, he finds financial salvation writing about Napoleon. So basically, you write about Napoleon, you are going to uh, bring yourself a profit. Um, I just want to, before I finish my introduction here, I want to talk to you briefly about the bicentenary. We've had a centenary, which occurred just over the years of the First World War up to 1921. And this was a massive uh, period in which historians leapt onto the Napoleon wave and would publish books that were have stood the test of time. I mean, the big publications of the time uh, are still those we use today in terms of research. I'm thinking here of Chaplin's Who's Who on St. Helena. It's the sort of the, the Bible. If you want to write about St. Helena, the first thing you do is go to Chaplin's Who's Who. Next one, 
Norwood Young wrote a very, very good book, two volumes called St. Helena, covered a lot of the covered a lot of the detail. So these are books that have really stood the time. And of course, finally, one remarkable book was by uh, slightly forgotten by a man called Watson, a lawyer of the early 20th century, who wrote about Piontkowski, a Napoleonic enthusiast, a Polish soldier. And this book is remarkable for its absolutely, absolute attention to detail, a complete tour de force of research. So these are the books that were, uh, were, we were using um, as part of as writing our books now in the bicentenary period. Now, the bicentenary period has already started, obviously, in continental Europe and also Britain. I mean, we did have quite a significant um, series of events in 1805 for Sea Britain for the Bicentenary of Trafalgar. And then uh, Waterloo was slightly less well covered, but still it had a certain amount of international uh, renown and uh, a certain number of publications came out. Since then, we've had, uh, most notably in French, uh, the memorial, which you mentioned earlier, James, by, uh, we've discovered the original manuscript of Las Gaz, which was lying in public, in plain view at the British Library in London. And so that was published, the first, the real edition that Las Gaz, that, had, that he'd studied with Napoleon, that they wanted to publish almost together. Napoleon obviously clearly had a uh, a, a say on what Lascaz was putting into this document, and it was ready for publication when his papers were seized, when Lascaz was expelled from the island in 18, uh, at the end of 1816. And then subsequently, we've had, uh, after the publication of the memorial by Lascaz, this proto-memorial, we've had the complete version of Gorgo's diaries. This was published last year, I think. And about now, about next week or in two weeks' time, we have a, a new version of uh, Bertrand's version of uh, his account of the years 1820 and 1821 with new, completely new information. So the bicentenary period is proving as rich as the centenary period did in its time. So I am going to talk to you this evening about uh, six or so, six or seven characters whose um, accounts of their uh, visit, their interviews, their conversations with Napoleon have kind of like slipped through the, the 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 cracks. They've been forgotten or they've been studied in ways that haven't been helpful. So I propose to introduce you this evening to William Henry Littleton, a liberal uh, member of parliament, uh, Denzel Ibbotson, relatively well known, but his, uh, his memoirs aren't, um, Mrs. Catherine Young Husband, who I think is a fascinating character. I'm also uh, Laura Wilkes, later Laura, Lady Buchan, daughter of St. Helena um, Governor Mark Wilkes, the direct predecessor of Hudson Lowe, the famous Hudson Lowe. Then I have discovered some very interesting memoirs of a, an English doctor called James Hall. And uh, finally, I'll be talking about Barry O'Mara, um, uh, a subject that I've been studying for many years now. One of the characteristics of my research has been, I live and work in Paris and I spend a lot of time in French sources and it does open interesting um, pathways to new discoveries. The, some of the discoveries here come via Germany and via France. And so a person working on English sources would not necessarily think to be looking in archives in continental Europe for material on Napoleon I. So I think that's one of the interesting points that my own work has shown that if the further, the broader you look, the more languages you look in and the, the, more, um, the more inquisitive you are, the more likely you are to find something that's interesting and new. So I'm going to start by, uh, with my PowerPoint presentation. Here we have William Henry, the third Baron Littleton of Frankly, this is a um, rather beautiful picture by Thomas Law after Thomas Lawrence, the, the original burnt down. Um, and this was taken in 1849. Uh, the copy was made in 1849. Supposedly, the original shows William Henry at about the time when he met Napoleon. Now, basically, uh, Littleton was uh, the related familiarly to the um, captain of the ship, going to St. Helena and the man who would become, in place of Mark Wilkes, the sort of military governor until the arrival of Hudson Lowe, that is Coburn. Now, Littleton was related to Coburn and hence was able to get a sort of uh, a sort of sneak onto the boat. Napoleon 
uh, meets him and says, how did you get on the boat? Are you going to St. Helena? He says, no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm here by, uh, because I've got family relations. Anyway, so uh, William Henry Littleton uh, was there with Lord Lowther. Lord Lowther was straight from the alien office. So basically, Littleton and Lord Lowther, the alien office being to do with, with um, sort of information, it's sort of information gathering, we might say sort of like MI5 these days or MI6. So at the alien office, Lord Lowther is clearly there to be picking up information. And Littleton is hanging around related to the uh, to Coburn, who's going out on board ship to St. Helena. Now, this conversation that they have together, uh, Littleton takes it down with Lowther. They get together in a pub after having met Napoleon once they go back on land and they uh, they write it down as best they can. He tells it in his, his account and then says, and then later in his life, towards the end of his life, he publishes 52 co private copies of his account published, largely um, disappeared. It's very difficult to find any of these copies today. I don't think there's one in the British Library. Uh, his grandson uh, took this original and sort of butchered it and changed it quite a lot and published a version of it in 1894, which was then translated into French. So this strange version of Lord Littleton's conversation with Napoleon was uh, had been published, but wasn't um, a real version of it. Um, subsequently, um, a version uh, of this, the earlier uh, 18, uh, the earlier version published in 1836 of the 52 private copies, this was translated into French by a French author in the 1940s. So this version came out and was, was, was circulating in French much better than it was circulating in English in its kind of like original version. However, um, it turns out that Lord Littleton was um, quite interested, particularly in uh, international relations with Saxony, during the period 1810, 1817, 1818. And it would appear that he was friends with the Saxon plenipotentiary in London, a man called Wilhelm von Just. So Wilhelm von Just, it would appear, took a, had a copy of Littleton's, the full version of Littleton's account of his conversation with Napoleon, which even more than the one that Littleton had published in his private uh, publication of 1836. So Wilhelm von Just goes back to Saxony. His papers go to the National Archives in Dresden, uh, where they are discovered by a German librarian who publishes them in 1858 in a German translation. Um, the manuscript was then subsequently, uh, a copy of it was sent to France during the publication of Napoleon's correspondence that was uh, published by Napoleon III during the Second Empire. So this, a copy of Lord Littleton's original manuscript as the one he'd given to Wilhelm von Just found itself in Paris. And this version uh, I happened to fall upon. So I have managed to rediscover the original version that Littleton had written down, copied by hand, even before he published his own version in 1836. So there we have an absolutely extraordinary um, early account of Napoleon on board Northumberland, which is where uh, Lord Littleton met him. And I've taken one particular quotation from it, which I think is rather nice, because liberals rather liked Napoleon. And he says, I quote, I should imagine it impossible not to admire his quickness, adroitness and originality, and the excellent command of temper that accompanied those spirited and agreeable qualities. So you can imagine that an average liberal in 1815 is going to be quite impressed with Napoleon. So let us move on. That's Lord Littleton. The next one I want to talk about this evening is Denzel Ibbotson. Now, Denzel Ibbotson was Deputy Com Commissary General uh, on St. Helena. Um, he went out on board Northumberland uh, with Coburn and Napoleon and his entourage uh, when they set out in August 1815, arriving in St. Helena on the 15th of October 1815. Now, we know Denzel Ibbotson because he's famous for his sketches. I've got a couple here that you might like to see. This is a wonderful sketch that he produced of Napoleon and the generals and his, uh, his, his entourage, as it were. There's looking, Gorgo's looking fantastic there with his, his very goofy look, his strange hair and his big nose. Then we've got 
um, Bertrand, the Grand Marshal Bertrand, next to facing Napoleon. He's got a little bald head. His shoulders famously slightly raised there. He was known by the British by his surname Shrug. And then, of course, there's Napoleon, who Denzel Ebbotson says he's a bit ventripotent, ventripotent, I think is the word. He's a little bit fat. And there he is in his... uh, in his imperial hat. Next to him is the tiny Lascars. Everyone said that Lascars was very, very small. But Lascars famously says, Napoleon for me is a giant, not only because he was a lot taller than Lascars, but also because he was a a great man of state. But uh, Lascars was having a little joke. So we have a tiny little Lascars next to Napoleon. And in the far right-hand side, the um, flash Harry of the group, the general Comte de Montalon. Who is looking rather, rather, rather sort of dashing there? He's he comes out best of all of those sketches there by Ibbotson. And then, of course, Ibbotson, there's another view of Napoleon. Good image, the slightly uh, bit of a tummy there, sitting against one of the cannons on Northumberland. This was given to the slightly uh, riotous figure of Theodore Hook, who was a famous author of the time, but also employed by Hudson Lowe to um, write uh, a rather swinging attack. Uh, on Barry O'Mara in 1818. Uh, Gorica's memoirs show that the, this account by Hook was actually piloted by Hudson Lowe and Sir Thomas Reed, rather interestingly. So Denzel Washington was famous for his sketches. A little did we know, he actually also wrote a little um, diary of his time on, the, um, on, on board Northumberland. And so um, he's... Uh, his diary is is kind of typical of a man that he was. He was a man who went on St. Helena. He organized the local theater. Um, Gideon Gorica, Hudson Lowe's ADC, refers to him as Denzel Periwinkle. So he was clearly a bit of a, a bit of a lovey, a bit of an actor. And um, he married a local girl, Martha Kay, who was uh, the daughter of a man who worked for the, um, the East India Company on St. Helena. He was generally liked. Betsy Balcom said everybody liked uh, Denzel Washington. And in the end, Denzel Washington organized Napoleon's funeral. The highlights of this new little, tiny little book. I mean, it's a small, small thing about this big, something like that, about um, three inches by five inches, maybe. And uh, we have details about the swords that Napoleon had with him, the famous Sabre d'Aboukir or the Glaive du Champ de Mai. Great, glorious uh, swords that still survive that are in French museums today, and we have an early account of them. Um, There's also some fascinating scenes. One of my favorites is a slightly um, cheeky moment, which clearly um, Ibbotson must have been slightly embarrassed about because someone had stuck a a piece of paper over this slightly ribald moment in his diaries because the conversation with Napoleon, uh, slightly silly as well, because the people Napoleon was talking to didn't speak French. So um, Napoleon asks at one point, clearly Denzel Ibbotson speaks French, says, does not the word miss mean also mademoiselle and whore? And uh, Denzel Washington, Denzel Ibbotson, sorry, has very carefully written W dot 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 E so as not to be too shocking in his uh, in his diary. And then Madame de Montalon, who's a bit a bit of a a bit of a goer, but a bit racy. Anyway, she she comes she intervenes at this point, trying to explain to someone who doesn't speak any French, and she says to say that a whore was une dame too much comme ça, and does a gesture with her hands. So rather charming, rather amusing, rather cheeky. Um, so his uh, we we now know quite all the the saucy details of what happened on board Northumberland, going to Saint Helena and arriving on the fifteenth of October. Now. I want to take you to uh, Catherine Winyet's Robertson young husband. Catherine, as I call her young husband, that was her final husband, um, was one of 14 children. And uh, she basically eloped with her husband against her family's will, a man called Robertson, to India in 1804. He died, unfortunately, very quick soon afterwards, um, as did her mother and her father. So she found herself alone with a small child in India, in uh, Kolkata, in East India. Um, And then she married again. She married this man here, Robert Younghusband. The the reason I haven't given you a photograph or a picture of um, Catherine Younghusband is I haven't found one and I don't believe one exists. It'd be lovely to know if there were one, um, but I don't think there is. Anyway, she um, she married Robert Younghusband in about 1812, 
And then he was posted with his regiment, the 53rd, to St. Helena. Um, she arrived, the 53rd were on board Northumberland as well. Napoleon famously says about um, uh, uh, Robert's young husband, he says it in Catherine Young Husband's uh, letter to her aunt. So maybe she's making it up. But Napoleon supposedly says, ah, que cet homme est superbe. Ah, this man is fantastic. He's so beautiful. He does look rather handsome, it must be said, with his rather fantastic mutton chops. Anyway, so he was clearly rather good looking. Um, Catherine Young Husband has a bit of a reputation as being a bit of a blue stocking, but she speaks French. She speaks Italian. She plays the piano. She has a daughter who sings and plays the piano. So, and she's interested in literature. She quite she writes rather nicely. Her letters are finally uh, published by uh, in some of the early newspapers of 1816, not under her name, but that's nevertheless published and slightly butchered um, because she had no uh, editorial control. Anyway, so she is obviously fascinated by Napoleon and also has contacts in high places because not only is she got a house up um, in Deadwood Plain with the regiment, she's also from time to time allowed to live in Plantation House with the governor, Mark Wilkes and his family. So she must have had strong, good connections. And she also is quite careful to be hanging around where Napoleon is in the hope to see him. Now, this is a strategy that everybody who goes to St. Helena does because they want to see Napoleon. What you do is you hang around and hope maybe he'll come out of the house or maybe he'll wander through the garden and you'll get a shot, you'll get a sight or you can something to write home about. Anyway, so boy, does she get something to write home about. She's wandering through the garden in the Briars, where Napoleon, the ha house that Napoleon is uh, lodged in before he goes up to Longwood House up on the plain, at, um, Deadwood Plain. Um, so she meets him and she writes to her aunt how Napoleon invites her in and how her daughter plays the piano. And then having met him, when he goes up to, North, uh, up to Longwood House, she is then invited to dinner. And we get a nice description of the dinner, the wonderful china that Napoleon has, um, famous china that we still have, some of which belongs to the Fondation Napoleon. So rather interesting to have the confirmation of the real life thing and also um, the, um, the china that, uh, that, that, that Napoleon was using on St. Helena. Anyway, so we move on. Um, she writes, uh, she's good friends with uh, Lascaz. She thinks he's one of the greatest writers of the time. And she also gives piano lessons to Bertrand's children. Um, she manages to be so much in Napoleon's good graces that she gets to her brother, who ap appears on the island briefly at one point, she gets him presented to Napoleon, which is quite an honor. Napoleon doesn't usually accept people, particularly as he goes later through 1816 and 1870, he starts refusing to receive people. So the fact that Catherine Young Husband got her brother received was a remarkable, a remarkable thing. What is also particularly interesting because of the manuscript that Catherine Young Husband, this letter that she writes to her aunt, is owned by the National Army Museum in Chelsea. Now, when you compare this original to the versions that were subsequently published of her letters, notably in Blackwood's magazine, you can see that Blackwood's magazine has had a go at the text. And so wherever she has written Emperor Napoleon, they've changed it to General Bonaparte. So taking us back to the struggle of the time itself, when Hudson Lowe said Napoleon must only be called General Bonaparte and because they wouldn't recognize the fact that he had been emperor for 10 years, and even though that continental Europe had largely accepted him as emperor, and indeed even uh, many in Britain largely dealt with him as the head of government. So it was a slightly odd um, situation of not accepting the, the imperial title, but it's very strange to see that editors in 1947 of Blackwood's magazine have returned to this struggle and changing Catherine Young Husband's text to make it read like she was fitting the uh, controversy of the time. Anyway, so moving on from Catherine Young Husband, I'd like to talk to you about Lady Laura Buchan, nay Wilkes. Now she was came out to St Helena um, with her father, age 16, um, in about 1812, 1813. Um, her father, Mark Wilkes, was an academic. Um, he had been, uh, had quite a significant career in India. Um, he, he wrote the first volume of one of the first histories of South India. He was remarkable because he spoke multiple languages, not particularly French, but he did speak Persian and I believe other 
um, Eastern, Middle Eastern languages too. Um, he was a friend of Sir Humphrey Davy. He was interested in science. Um, and he, he got the job, I think, in St. Helena as a kind of like a sinecure, which would allow him to basically um, finish his publications. The three volumes of the first volume of which was published in 1810, the later volumes were all published in 1817 of his history of South India. So clearly moving to St. Helena was an idea that would the, that would give him time to do to make his to get his publication out. Um, he was governor on St. Helena when Napoleon arrived. And what's rather remarkable about this is he didn't know that Napoleon was coming. He found out five days before Napoleon arrived, a special a cutter from the fleet that was bringing Napoleon said, hang on a minute, you guys are going into lockdown, to use a technical term of, the, of today. Napoleon is coming and you're going to have to deal with it. So that must have been a huge surprise to Mark Wilkes and his daughter. They were subsequently much appreciated, not just by Lascaz, but also Napoleon, because Mark Wilkes really had no power once Napoleon and Coburn and um, Bingham arrived. These were the people who were actually in charge of the island. Uh, Mark Wilkes was at that point governor in name only, uh, as, as St. Helena was in lockdown with their imperial prisoner. Um, so Hudson, um, sorry, Mark Wilkes is received by Napoleon twice. Um, and the conversations are recorded by Catherine, young husband, and Laura Wilkes. So these two ladies go up with Napoleon, and presumably that Laura Wilkes is said to have spoken French like a native, and clearly Catherine, young husband, couldn't get around in French too. So these are the two that are the basically amanuenses of this wonderful conversation uh, which Napoleon has with Mark Wilkes. Napoleon tends to talk about the same things when he meets English people. He always talks about indigo, sugar beet, and pastel, and occasionally Sir Humphrey Davy, which was very useful for, Sir Mark, for Mark Wilkes because he knew Sir Humphrey Davy. But these are kind of traditional conversations. There's also one specific remark about Tipu Sultan, which is particularly interesting because Napoleon claimed to have been in contact with Tipu Sultan and Mark Wilkes, who had actually known Tipu Sultan and had been in India at the time that Tipu Sultan was killed, um, he said he talked to Tipu Sultan's secretaries and was in the archives there. And he said there was no, there were no letters ever by Napoleon. So an interesting kind of first eyewitness account of Napoleon, Napoleon's links with South India, which brings me to my next. I'm going quickly here because I have limited amount of time and uh, and I'm trying not to uh, overstep my welcome. Um, now, what next? I want to talk to you about another discovery. This is James Hall. Now, James Hall, a 33-year-old, would have just been promoted to the, the rank of surgeon on HMS Favourite, and he was sent out to St. Helena to form part of the cordon sanitaire around the island, stopping any boats coming in. He spent most of his life, unluckily for him, most, most of this time, sorry, in this, in this period at St. Helena in 1817 and 1818 at Ascension Island. Now, Ascension Island is notable for the fact that it was even worse than St. Helena. Um, basically, there was a heavy swell off the coast all the time. It was full of rats. There was nothing to eat. Nothing would grow. All you could have was turtles. They could fish turtles, 20 or 30 per night. So there were plenty survived with turtle soup, but not much else. So it's a pretty grim place. James Hall was on the boat on uh, favorite HMS Favourite for two years. He came to St. Helena twice. Or he, so he writes in his uh, in his memoirs. Now these memoirs are really interesting because they're completely unknown. Now, basically, what happened was Omar. Uh, sorry, uh, James Hall wrote his memoirs. They were left in a family in a family archive. They were published in 1926 by a subsequent uh, a descendant of James Hall but not specifically noted as Napoleon on St. Helena. They were just part of, a, of a, a life of James Hall or famous members of the King Hall family. Now, fair enough, but this, lo this family historian cut out certain parts of the original manuscript. As luck would have it, this manuscript became known to a French scholar in the 19, late 1930s. Now, he knew the two uh, characters from the King Hall family who very kindly sent him a copy of the original manuscript, which had been published only partly in uh, 1926. So this French scholar uh, 
translated into French the complete version of James Hall's memoirs. And this time they were published in a slightly obscure French journal. So they've been largely forgotten, not just by the Napoleonic Republic, but in people in general. So this uh, I happened upon in a library. And what it does, uh, what his memoirs are remarkable, uh, what they show is that James Hall was closely connected with Barry O'Mara at the crucial time when Barry O'Mara, Napoleon's doctor on St. Helena, who was about to be expelled. Now, Barry O'Mara was about to be expelled because by Hudson Lowe, by the governor, their relations had been in a terrible state since most of 1817 and the beginning of 1818 because um, Barry O'Mara was convinced that Napoleon was ill and probably had hepatitis. Now, hepatitis is a problem because hepatitis is the disease of the islands. Now, if you've got the disease of the islands, that means sending Napoleon to St. Helena was uh, gave him hepatitis. And if sending him to St. Helena gave him hepatitis and he died of hepatitis, sending him to St. Helena was in fact a death sentence. So given that context of hepatitis being the disease you don't want, um, Hudson Lowe basically refuses to accept the diagnosis of hepatitis. This leads to a big uh, disagreement between the two men. And finally, um, leads to Barry O'Mara's expulsion. Um, so James Hall arrives from Ascension Island to St. Helena in July 1818, just at the very moment where Barry O'Mara has be, is basically been threatened by Hudson Lowe that he's going to get rid of him. Barry O'Mara has also offered his resignation, but London has refused to accept it. So Hudson Lowe has found himself obliged to keep O'Mara. One of the advantages of O'Mara, who is Napoleon's private doctor who lives in Longwood House, is that he is party to Napoleon in an intimate way. He knows the details. So he's very important for the administration on the island that they have an English speaking person right in the heart of Longwood House, which is the centre is where Napoleon, you know, the private part of Napoleon's life. So obviously the British government sees Despite the fact that Hudson Lowe and Barry O'Mara don't see eye to eye, British government want him in because they need him in. Once the relationship between Hudson Lowe and Barry O'Mara falls to pieces, Barry O'Mara becomes closer and closer to Napoleon, becomes more intimate with him and starts probably working for Napoleon. It's not even sure whether he isn't paid by Napoleon. Not entirely clear. He certainly is paid by Napoleon afterwards as are other doctors, but I don't think he's paid by Napoleon before. It's not entirely clear. Anyway, and James Hall arrives in St. Helena and gets to spend time with Barry O'Mara just about at the same time as Barry O'Mara is about, is becoming closer to Napoleon and is about to be expelled. So his memoirs are absolutely fascinating. He gives us key details about some of the um, secret letters written by people from St. Helena up to Longwood, which were burnt and found in charred remains in the house after Napoleon's death in 1821, which Hudson Lowe pieced together. So details of these charred letters appear in uh, James Hall's memoirs. So obviously they're extremely interesting. These um, will give us a new view of the struggle between Hudson Lowe and Barry O'Mara, but also um, quite how the relationship between the French in Longwood and the rest of the island, notably with one of the key figures who is less known in the in this, who's called Louis Gideon Solomon, um, a slightly shadowy figure, but clearly of interest and in close relation, in close contact with Longwood House. Now we see. So that's I'm racing along here. So now I'm going to talk to you about Barry O'Mara, um, subject that I have most uh, worked on. Barry O'Mara was the uh, surgeon on board Bellerophon in 1815 when Napoleon handed himself over. Napoleon said, can I have this man? Napoleon, Barry O'Mara had the abs absolute advantage of speaking a bit of French, but also fluent Italian. So Napoleon thought this would be good. I can have someone who can look after me and who speaks Italian also because his own doctor had refused to go to St. Helena. So Barry O'Mara is uh, he writes to the Admiralty and says, am I allowed? Can I do this? Please make sure that I'm still paid by the British Navy because I don't want to be in a difficult position. 
And they say yes, okay, and they realize the advantage of having uh, a man inside uh, close up to Napoleon. This picture, I think, is particularly interesting because it's largely unknown. There's a very famous image of, Napo of Barry O'Mara, which he produces in his the front cover of his book. Uh, this one was copied in 1832 when Barry O'Mara had become a full on paid up member of the Bonapartist party and was hanging out with Joseph Bonaparte in London. This is sketched by Joseph Bonaparte's daughter, Charlotte, in 1832. Anyway, quite an accurate, I think, representation of him 10 years after the event, 12 years, he's got a bit older. He apparently got a bit fat as well, ate too much and drank too much. Uh, he was doing the London lecture circuit. And I think that had some effect on his, um, on his uh, physical, um, his physical frame and, and led eventually, so they said, to his death. Anyway, Barry O'Mara went out on Northumberland as Napoleon's doctor and stayed with him until they and then went up to live in Longwood House with Napoleon until the middle of 1818. Barry O'Mara is particularly interesting because he is one of what uh, Henry Heine described as the gospel makers of St. Helena. Now, these days, people talk about the gospel makers of St. Helena. They talk about the books that were published later. So they're not really. Heine was actually referring to Lascaz, O'Mara and Antomarchi as the gospel makers of St. Helena. Now, his book was published before Lascaz in French in Italian, in English, in Swedish, in German, covered the whole of Europe, uh, made him a very wealthy man. His book went into four or five different editions within months of its publication in 1822. Um, he, uh, the, the police set up a special cordon outside the bookshop um, in Stationers Hall so that the public could be go through into the bookshop, buy their copy of the book and be filter out the back end of the shop without causing a riot. So it's a huge, huge event. Not just was Barry O'Mara giving the inside story on Napoleon, he was also giving his side of the story and what was to become the talk of London, uh, which was the feud between Barry O'Mara and Hudson Lowe as to um, whether Hudson Lowe had in fact intimated to Barry O'Mara that maybe it would be cheaper for everybody and I'm a lot less bother if Napoleon maybe had an accident or maybe he didn't receive the medical treatment he needed. This was the myth or this was the story that O'Mara told the Admiralty when he was expelled from the island. And so obviously Hudson Lowe was furious with this and wanted to take uh, Barry O'Mara to court. So he tried to set up a court case in 1823 and 1824, which finally didn't actually happen because Hudson Lowe waited too long to in to get his his court case going. So that fell down, and uh, the winner of this feud between Barry O'Mara and Hudson Lowe was in fact Barry O'Mara because he made so much money out of the publication of his story of Napoleon, but also stabbing Hudson Lowe in the back uh, that he he didn't need to get a job anymore. He was independently wealthy. He married a very old lady who also gave him a thousand pounds a year. Um, and lived the rest of his life um, quite happily, w going between France and England, working, sort of generally participating in Bonapartist things, publications. He published a book called The Errors of Bourienne in 1830 in English. Uh, and he worked alongside Joseph Bonaparte when Joseph Bonaparte left America to come to London um, with the aim of putting uh, Napo Napoleon's son, the King of Rome, on the throne of France instead of Louis Philippe. So this is Barry O'Mara's right in the centre of the Bonapartist thing in Britain and in continental Europe over the years 1822 to 1836 when he dies. The reason uh, that he's particularly interesting at the moment is because though his book was widely published in many different languages, his notebooks had survived. They survived uh, and were um, where they were given in, um, uh, they were willed to Joseph Bonaparte's secretary. And so they went over to the United States. There were 19 notebooks from which Barry O'Mara had composed his uh, book on Napoleon, Napoleon in Exile, published in 1822. So these notebooks existed. They were, um, they, we know they still exist in 1900, 
because one of the descendants of Joseph Bonaparte's secretary tries to sell them to Century Magazine, one of the big periodicals, uh, world periodicals. I think it's read not only in the UK, but also in America. Um, and he, he was trying to sell the Barry O'Mara's notebooks for publication in Century Magazine. Century Magazine had been publishing um, material on Napoleon for the previous 15 years. So they had a series of Napoleonic publications. So it made sense that they should be sold to Century Magazine. Century Magazine, however, refused to buy the things. They thought maybe um, we don't need all of this stuff, but we will publish some of it because some of it is new. And so in 1900, uh, over two or three different issues of Century Magazine, they published bits of his notebooks. Now, these bits have been largely forgotten and they produce, they've got new and interesting details regarding Napoleon's experience on St. Helena and more fleshing out with more detail quite his existence at Longwood and uh, his relationship with the English there. So I'm going to stop there in terms of the English and their, um, and their relations with Napoleon. I just want to conclude by saying, I think one of the most interesting things is Napoleon, the study of Napoleon is a profoundly European endeavor. It involves all the European countries and it involves Britain, but with a strong admixture of European archives. So um, the documents are scattered throughout Europe. Lots of Napoleonic letters are in Moscow. Uh, Eugène de Beauharnais, for example, all of his archives are in America. So the, 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 the documents related to Napoleon are worldwide. And so and these eyewitness accounts, which are scattered in different archives, uh, reveal remarkable details about the emperor, but also those around him and give an idea of the zeitgeist, the feel, the quite exactly how it was on St. Helena at the time. Um, one thing I think is particularly interesting also is Napoleon is a profoundly political subject. And so when you come to talk about Napoleon, you might find that some people, notably of a conservative bias, might emphasize Napoleon's dictatorial streak, whilst those of a more liberal style, say, for example, um, William Littleton, would emphasize him as a purveyor of the French Revolution and all the modernity that comes with that. Um, and so the O'Mara feud with Hudson Lowe is not just about um, Napoleon being ill and um, Barry O'Mara um, telling Hudson Lowe that Napoleon's ill and Hudson Lowe refusing to accept that. It's also to do with political differences. And uh, Barry O'Mara ends up being slightly liberal, slightly in favour of Napoleon. And certainly when he leaves Longwood, Napoleon gives him asks his mother to give him a grant, asks his sister to give him a grant in order to, to help him survive the fact that he'd been kicked out of the British Navy. So, um, and indeed his aligning himself with Napoleon post St. Helena, this is Barry O'Mara, means he contracted, a, made it a remarkably successful future out of the ruins of his time on St. Helena. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, so your presentation has raised a number of questions. I'm getting some really excellent questions coming through in the chat function. And if anyone watching has any additional questions, please do put them into the chat and I'll try and cover them in the next 10 minutes or so. Um, and I will come back, if it's okay, to the question of Mario O'Mara, which you finished with. I know that's a particular area of expertise, so I'd like to dig into that a little bit more. Um, but before we do that, it might be best if, could we just step back a little bit for anyone who's watching and who doesn't quite understand why it is that anyone who's British at that time might have any sympathy to Napoleon whatsoever. And, and what's clear in many of those stories you've just told is that people were curious, but they were also sympathetic about the man himself. Um, you said at the start of your presentation um, that liberals rather liked Napoleon. Um, can you just explain that a little bit more, why that, why that might be the case? Well, I think basically what happens is he's a stick with which to beat the opposition with. So um, Britain is profoundly 
I use a French term, ancien régime. It's profoundly unreformed. It takes until 1832 before there's even the, an idea of, um, of political reform. The Catholic emancipation is a thing that, that rumbles on through the whole of the 19th century. So there's a, if you're kind of liberal, if you have modern feelings, what you see in France under Napoleon is at least equality, or you think you see equality, or you see a kind of state that you would like Britain to be like. So you can see the positivity. If you see Napoleon as the continuer of the French Revolution, then you can see that actually, if I have to get a, the only way I can get a job is by being the brother of so-and-so or being driven or being supported by Lord whoever, then it doesn't seem fair. There's a, there's a lot of the middle classes of continental Europe, notably those in Italy, but also uh, in Germany, those who are liberal, find themselves suddenly able to have a career where they couldn't before because they didn't have the support, they didn't have the network of the that, that kind of um, old-fashioned, old-world thing of patronage and support and being born into the job and not being born into the job, that kind of thing. So you can see that Napoleon at that point represents, with the myth, it may not even be true, but he represents a myth of that, that somehow there's the possibility you can be a soldier in the Napoleonic army and the marshal's baton is in your knapsack. Possibly, maybe, but the idea is kind of true. And so you can get ahead. Poor old James Hall there. Being, he was 33 before he became a full surgeon on HMS Favourite, taking him quite a while to get up the tree, and he's still not paid that much. So, you know, it, it, it's not a career for talents. It's a career for who you know and, and who will support you and how much money you have. So you can see that a liberal public at that point would go, hang on, actually, no, I prefer this French version where it's a, it seems, may not be, but it seems a little fairer. Okay, um, and I'd like to turn to one of the questions now. So if the um, British impressions of Napoleon are quite well documented, as you've laid out, um, is there any material, and this is Joseph Mendes asking this question, is there any material on what Napoleon thought about his British admirers that he met on St. Helena? Yes, well, I mean, take Lady, Lady Holland, of course. I mean, Lady Holland, he's so pleased. She sends him cases of books. She sends him an ice machine. She's, uh, she's like, Holland House is the centre of liberal politics in London. They're quite, they're champagne socialists. You know, they're not, they're not like, you know, they're not, uh, they're not Karl Marx. But uh, she's sending him books. She's sending him stuff. And so Napoleon uh, bequeaths her a lovely um, snuff box, a sort of presentation box, which is now, uh, at the British Museum. So there are, uh, he, he appreciates his British supporters. Cam Hobhouse, Cam Hobhouse, Lord Brougham, is another massive supporter, closely linked to Holland House. He sends out Napoleon a book, which he's written about the Hundred Days, which is very positive towards Napoleon. Napoleon loves the book. Hudson Lowe refuses to give it to him because he's, Cam Hobhouse has written in the cover to the great Napoleon. Napoleon thinks, so oh, I can't possibly give him that book because it says in it, the great Emperor Napoleon, or the Emperor Napoleon the Great. Um, finally, he does. He sends it out and Napoleon thinks, oh, right, I'm going to write a commentary on this book because it's fantastic and it puts me in the right light. So he does like, and we do have uh, evidence. Uh, also, I think uh, particularly there's um, a wonderful... Um, I think particularly in Barry O'Mara's thing, he talks about the publications that Napoleon reads. And we have a wonderful example of Napoleon getting into his hands three volumes of a biography of himself. So he's, he's got three volumes written in 1815 by a man called Hewiston. And there are some funny, there are some pictures in it. And he jokes to Mario O'Mara. He says, listen, you know, there's a picture. Here's a picture of me crossing the Alps with my sword in my hands. What do they think I'm going to do? Do they think that we're trying to cut my way through the rocks? You know, he, he's like mocking the engraving, which is on the first page of volume two. So there's a nice piece of sort of intertextuality. You can see you've got the volume. You can know you've got the story of Napoleon talking about the volume, which you have in your own hands. So you can really live the history at the same time. Great. OK. And then so to move on to Omara, um, you mentioned Hook's pamphlet, um, which... I think I'm right in saying essentially accused Amara of being a turncoat, a traitor, betraying uh, Britain. 
why shouldn't we consider Omara in that in that light? Well, I know this is this is the question. I think it. it I think you the, the important thing is to try and abstract yourself from the politics of the time. So we have when Barry Omara is put in place, he is part of the previous um, administration. When Hudson Lowe arrives in April of 1816, he comes out with his own entourage. Barry Omara is in place. He was in Coburn's setup before Hudson Lowe arrives. Now, we just talked about the Ancien Regime. Hudson Lowe comes out with his men. What's he going to do with his men? He's going to put them in place. That's what you do when you're the boss. You put your men in place. Now, he has in his entourage a doctor, Baxter. Now, uh, he wants to put Baxter in Barry O'Mara's place because but Baxter is Hudson Lowe's man. Barry O'Mara has the unfortunate thing of also knowing what happened to Napoleon in um, the island of Capri. Now, there's one blot on the career of Hudson Lowe. It's he lost the island of Capri in 1808. Now, Barry O'Mara happens to be round there at that time. He knows perfectly well what happened to, to Hudson Lowe in 1808. He knows all about the shame of the loss of Capri. So Hudson Lowe doesn't want Omar, and Omar is a little bit liberal. You know, Hudson Lowe is a man of the of the of the Ancien Regime. He's a man of the establishment. He's made it big. He's got this great job. He comes from he comes from basically nowhere to become Lieutenant Colonel. So Lieutenant, sorry, Lieutenant General. So he's 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 had his meteoric career rise, and he wants to do the thing. And he's a man of the a man of the government. He's employed by Lord Bathurst. Uh, Goulburn is one is is one of his uh, collaborators. Um, so he's a man, and so there's no. It's kind of almost written in the stars that Hudson Lowe and Barry O'Mara aren't going to get on. And then there's also the story that Hudson Lowe, Barry O'Mara is writing to people at the Admiralty behind Hudson Lowe's back, telling them stories about what's going on. We have the letters; they're not that bad, they're not that unpleasant to Hudson Lowe, but it's the the the, the principle of the thing, and that the. Uh, the 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 Lord Bathurst knows about it. Even the Prince Imperial is uh, sorry. The Prince the Prince Regent is receiving Barry Omar's letters, and they're all chuckling about them. So there's a kind of like chuckling behind the back of Hudson Lowe. So that's kind of like bad for Barry Omar. Kind of kind of bad. So when Barry Omar says, "Hang on, Napoleon's poorly. He's ill," and Napoleon, of course, Napoleon's health is political. It's political. So we can't afford to have Napoleon be ill because he might be making it up. And if he is making it up, uh, you know, that's that's wrong. And, and Barry Mara has fallen into the trap of accepting that Napoleon might be ill. So Hudson Lowe does this thing where I want my man in. We're not of the same political color. Barry Mara is telling me stuff I don't want to believe. It may be true, may not be true, but I don't want to believe it. Because if, um, you know, if it's true, then... Uh, we have to get rid of Napoleon from St. Italy. We've got to take him away, bring him back to Europe, because that's otherwise St. Italy is going to kill him because hepatitis is the disease of the tropics. So he can't afford to have that diagnosis. And he has to believe that Napoleon is basically lying or that he's bought Barry O'Mara and that Barry O'Mara is like uh, a paid man. He's like been bribed. And so, But when you look at the correspondence of O'Mara, there's a change as the difficulty between Hudson Lowe and O'Mara gets worse. Barry O'Mara gets closer and closer to Napoleon. Napoleon's very charming. Everybody says this. He's super charming. He's very clever and very nice. And when it's not political, he can charm the pants off anybody. So Barry O'Mara gets charmed. He feels that, that Napoleon is poorly. He may indeed have hepatitis. We don't know. And he feels that Hudson Lowe is being a bit difficult. Hudson Lowe is generally renowned as not being very good with people. He's not an easy character. He's a bit difficult. He's got a funny look. Um, he may or may not be a bad guy. It's difficult to say, but there's a, there are political reasons. There are personal reasons. There are political reasons why they won't get on. So their relationship falls to pieces. Hudson Lowe pushes Omara in over the edge into Napoleon's arms. And then that's what happens. So when, Napoleon, when finally Barry Omara is expelled from the island and cashiered from the Navy, then he has no money. He's got no career. And then he needs what Napoleon has given him. Uh, it must be said that Napoleon also, that Barry O'Mara does participate in the publication of certain books by Napoleon because as things, as the relationship with Hudson Lowe falls to pieces, he has to see where his 
support is. And so he goes closer to Napoleon. So you could say, I mean, he, he tries to get out of it and say, yes, I didn't betray my country. I believed it was true. I thought he was dying. Hudson Lowe very probably did have a conversation with him, which he said, yeah, it's all going to be a lot. Easier. It would be so much easier if he, if he just didn't carry on. Wouldn't it be? You know, you can imagine that conversation. It's not beyond the wit of man. Hudson, Hudson Lowe had a had a career earlier on, even before Capri as a spy. So he's not he's not a he's a hard guy. He's a hard guy. He would he, he would say that, and then he would deny it. Of course he would. Of course he'd deny it. So so Barry Omar is in this very difficult position, uh, but he does he does come out of it amazingly. Luckily, because Hudson Lowe's fannies about, he doesn't get his he doesn't attack Barry Omar in court early enough. The court can't accept the trial and so he gets away scot-free and at that point Barry Omar off into the wide view Londres and Hudson Lowe not so good gets a second rate career gets a second rate posting after being at St Helena the government has changed now there's a liberal administration in power and the people who supported Hudson Lowe earlier on are no longer there so he's like hung out to dry he's the guy who's responsible for everything so yeah it's really hard to say quite how far Omara is somehow is a traitor. Dunno, dunno. He's pushed. He it's a slow development. He gets taken out of the army for something, the navy rather, for something that he really didn't do. Uh, he's like caught in the mid. He's caught in the middle of a power struggle. But he's he's initially the damage, I suppose, and so he does what he can. He he does what he can to to, to survive, I suppose. I think that's my reply. Yeah. And of course, he, he does so well out of that because there is this enormous appetite mm. for stories from St. Helena. Um, David Young asks, why was the British public more interested in reading accounts of Napoleon's exile than the French? Well, of course, France, France is trying to forget about Napoleon. They were, they're not going to want, I mean, not, not only France won't let books be published about Napoleon during the first, the second restoration, of course. Uh, he's the previous administration. He's been kicked out. France is, is in denial. It's like, oh, it never happened. That empire thing. We're not doing it. All the publications that are published in French about Napoleon appear in Belgium. Belgium is the place where you can publish in French without having the French censor say no. So that's the French... They'll, there will be people in France who are supporters of Napoleon, but they have to, they're lying low. They're lying low because this is the time, even when Napoleon dies, um, there's no real question of Napoleon's body being repatriated to France because, you know, why? It's, it's, it, all it does is disturb the now royal France with it, memories of its difficult imperial past. So, um, there's, uh, I think what's more interesting is that why do British people publish about Napoleon before 1815? I mean, there's a lot, I think, why, why there's such an appetite for uh, biographies of Napoleon in English when there isn't necessarily an appetite. There are biographies published in France about Napoleon, but the censor in, in Napoleonic France is very strong. And so they tend to only produce things that are very positive, whereas a biography of Napoleon in English can be a little bit freer, a little bit more, can, doesn't have to pull its punches. But there is an appetite for them, mostly in liberal circles, must be said. Um, there's, a, there's a translation of Machiavelli's Prince, for example, the famous thing. And the introduction to this is 100 pages long. And it's basically a biography of Napoleon and says, look at Napoleon. He's like, Mach he's like Machiavelli's Prince. If we're going to beat Napoleon, we have to out Machiavelli Napoleon. This was published in 1810. So a, uh, a, a, um, an, a, um, some, a, a publication that's designed for a public that would be of the establishment can also read histories of Napoleon, but with a, with a, with a view to beating him. You know, that uh, Napoleon, yes, he may be Machiavellian, but he's still pretty good. And we've got to out Machiavelli him to beat him. OK. Um, OK. And then final question for tonight. So Vincent Murphy asks, uh, clearly you've managed to uncover some fantastic original sources. Um, is there anything that could be considered a lost gospel of St. Helena? Or oh, yes. 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 The one I, exist, yes. Uh, yes. Yes. The one, yet I, been found? the one I would love to find. Well, I'd love to find Barry O'Mara's notebooks. I mean, they disappeared in 1903. They just disappeared into the into the into the into the undergrowth. That would be really interesting to find those. They must. They're probably in somebody's private collection. Nineteen little little hand, handbooks. If anyone's listening out there, 
19 little handbooks. I'd like to see them. Uh, the other one, the other one, I think the one I'd really like to see is um, the, uh, the, bug, the, the notes of another doctor. This was the second doctor to be expelled from St. Helena by Hudson Note in even worse circumstances than Barry O'Mara. This is a man called Stoko. Anyway, and he saw Napoleon three times, tried to do his best. Um, it wasn't good enough. He gets sent back to England without being told what's the matter. He's going to defend himself. And then they send him straight. He gets off the boat. They put him straight back on the boat, send him back to City. This is four months of boat travel. London, so St. Helena, London, London, St. Helena. He gets off the boat at St. Helena. He's a court martial. He's court martialed on a trumped up charge for having been not supporting Napoleon when he was, he, he, there were letters proving that he tried. Anyway, so he gets done and he gets sent back to, uh, like Omar, he gets sent back to London and is cashiered. Napoleon again gives him some money, not as much because he doesn't know him quite so well. Anyway, Stoko then is employed by Joseph Bonaparte's wife to look after Charlotte Bonaparte, the one who sketches Barry O'Mara. And he acts as her private doctor for most of the decade, 1820, 1830, and then uh, is also in London in 1832 when Barry O'Mara is there, when Joseph comes in 1832 with the, to try and put the King of Rome on, on the throne of France. So his memoirs were known in 1900. They were translated into French, but apparently they were very verbose. And so the French guy said, oh, I had to shorten them and I had to change them a lot. And so, and then these memoirs were published in French and then that French translation was retranslated back into English by somebody to make the English version of Stokoe's memoirs. So Stokoe's memoirs, not only for the period on St. Helena, but also for the period in Point Breeze, where Joseph lived in America in the years 1820, 1816 through to 1830, to 1836, finally, they would be absolutely fascinating, not just Napoleon I, but also Joseph, and also a key witness to what happened in Point Breeze in America, in Pennsylvania. So, yeah, if anyone's out there with the memoirs of Stoko, I'm your man. Brilliant. Thank you, Peter. Thank you so much. That was a really great presentation. Thank you all for your questions. Sorry we couldn't cover them all. We try and keep the talks to an hour, and we've actually gone a little bit over because that was so great. So thank you. Um, I'll just repeat those dates. Um, the 18th of March and the 15th of April. Please do put those dates in your diary for the next events uh, in our programme, which will then take us up to May. And maybe there be, may be a bicentenary event uh, from the 5th of May, but watch this space. Please do join our mailing list uh, for us to send you updates at the end of the month on what we will be doing in May. Okay, thank you very much, everybody, and good night. Good night.